Um, and we're going to begin this morning with our opening song played by Sheila Kaloran, which is Where Do We Come From? Whether in person or online, we begin each Westwood service with an acknowledgement that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality, and continues to do so today. The Westwood building rests in Amiskatee, Waskahagan, which is the Cree name for Edmonton and translates into English as Beaver Hill House. I'm joining you today from Shoe Chotue which is the Dene Shoshine word for cold lake and translates to English as big fish lake. Although part of Treaty 6 territory, the First Nations history of this area differs from that of other locations throughout Treaty 6. While much of Treaty 6 was historically inhabited by the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, the area I'm located in is the southern edge of the Dene Shoshine nation. While land acknowledgements have become a way to respectfully draw attention to the journey of reconciliation and decolonization, the embarkation point of that journey, as with most other reconciliation journeys, should be to educate ourselves on the journey of those who took care of this land before us. There are many opportunities that exist in all communities for connection, growth, and education on the important questions of how can we help and how can we heal. Welcome this morning to Westwood Unitarian Congregation's online Sunday service. Westwood is one of many Canadian Unitarian congregations. I'd like to out welcome everyone to this safe and sacred space where we can come together to rest, to grow, and to serve the world. My name is Maddie and I use he, him pronouns. I'm happy to be your service leader this morning. Our musicians are Sheila Kaloran and Rebecca Patterson. We are always grateful for the wonderful service tech support of Alara Stefania Cadet and Bill Lee. And our speaker today is Westwood's very own Reverend Ann Barker. If you have a candle or a chalice nearby, now is the time to bring them forward. Our chalice lighting this morning um, is long. It comes from the book Shelter in This Place, Meditations on 2020, edited by Meg Riley. And, oh wait, I'm wrong. That's our closing candle extinguishing. Forget I said anything. It's still long though. The opening is long. It comes from the UUA worship web. It is written by the Reverend Lisa Bovey Kemper and is entitled Circle of Care. In religious community, we share our joys and our triumphs, our sorrows and our broken places. 
In this circle of care, we make space for the complexity of life, the myriad experiences that bless and break our hearts. The truth of human experience dictates that on any given day, we each come to the table with hearts in different places. It is especially so on this day, invented to honor women who nurture. In this circle of care, we honor the truth that mothering is not and never will be quantified in one single descriptor. Mothering can be elusive or infuriating, fulfilling or confusing, commonplace or triumphant. It exists in the everyday experiences of each person. There is no human being that is not connected to or disconnected from a mother. And so we honor the complexity of experience writ large in flowered platitudes. But here in this space laid bare, honoring the truth in each of our hearts, there is room for all in this circle. If you have carried a child or children, whether or not they came to be born, we see you. If you have fervently wished to do so, and circumstances of fate made it impossible, we see you. If you love children you cannot see, whether because of death or estrangement, we see you. If you never wanted to be a mother, we see you. If you are happy to mother other people's children as an educator, an auntie, or a foster parent, we see you. If your mother hurt you, physically or emotionally, we see you. If you had no mother at all, we see you. If your mother is or was your best friend, mother. we see you. If you wonder whether your mothering has been enough, we see you. If yours is a different truth altogether, we honor your unspoken story. There is room for all in this circle. May it be so today and always. Blessing. At this time in our service, we pause to reflect on the past week. We recall the milestones, the joys, concerns, and sorrows the changes in our lives, and those who may need our healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. When I think of community being deepened in this way, I think of how the depth of community can lead to the creation of a chosen family. I am a member of many families, one of which is my military family. Yesterday, many members of that family came together to celebrate the life of one of our own. Warren Officer Tim Balatz was a member of the Royal Canadian Air Force who served an incredible 41 years of his nearly 60 years of life before succumbing to cancer last Sunday, May 1st. Warren Officer Balatz was a member of my unit, one Air Maintenance Squadron, here at Four Wing in Cold Lake. As military members, we may not all fight on the battlefield, but we all field our own battles. As the greater community has lost five members in the last 10 days, I hold them all in my heart. I now invite you to share your joys and concerns in the chat while we listen to Sheila play.
We recognize that not all joys and concerns are shared out loud. Please join me now in the affirmation you see posted on the screen. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Westwood Unitarian is entirely self-governed and financially supported by the kind generosity of our members and friends. As in the wonderful Candor and Ebb musical Cabaret from the song, Money, Money, a mark, a yen, a buck or a pound, a buck or a pound, a buck or a pound is all that makes the world go around. That clinking, clanking sound can make the world go round. Donations are accepted and appreciated at any time by following the instructions on the slide or on our webpage. Now, please join Rebecca in singing our offertory song while remaining on mute. From you I receive, to you I give. I want to tell you about the time that the Earth Mother was at risk and all her children, her creatures, her life forms rallied, each devoting their one precious life to her tender care and restoration. I want to tell you that no one was hurt in the process, or if they were, they recovered, were restored, and lived a better, more meaningful life because of the ordeal. But even the story of the fall of Sky Woman, told by Robin Wall Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass, has little otter, the unexpected saving hero of the moment, mm. losing his own life in the process. A sacrifice he bravely made that helped to create a home for all who would follow our home, a home he would not experience. I want to tell you a story about a time when all the beings came together and made a decision to work together to change their community, local or global, for the betterment of all. I want to tell you that it all worked out, that there was an end to cruelty, to poverty, to hunger, to fear, to war. I want to share the tale of the end of marginalization, of selfishness, of deceit. I want to talk about love and only love winning. But love is not a contest. It's a practice. And it does not create agreement. It is a map of many paths. And freedom is never won. It is always a negotiation, an argument never settled. And the systems and structures we create for governance will often dictate the outcomes. Now I'm struggling this morning, this Mother's Day morning to resist the urge to scream at the heavens about how hard people have worked for generations to bring reproductive freedom to people with uteruses, only to see it slipping away in what is so ironically described as the most powerful nation in the world. I want to stop the wheels from turning back time. I want to believe this won't happen in Canada. I want to trust that safety gained will not be lost. Those, my friends, are sentences that we could spend hours parsing. We will not do that this morning. We'll leave them there as the blistering heartbreak they represent while we talk about differences of opinion 
and clashes of ideals. World peace. I think we can all agree that that is a noble goal. But what kind of peace? The kind that means no bloodshed, but also requires a shortfall of freedom? The kind that means justice for all, but costs another world war? The kind that means we all affirm and promote the interdependent web of all existence, but air travel is now canceled due to environmental impacts. The kind that means we stop pillaging the planet, but only the wealthy have comfort and resources. How about basic needs met for all? Food and shelter and safety and education. It's hard to argue with until we consider the trades that might be necessary. We have cultures that prioritize the well being of the country, the community, the family over the rights of the individual, and nations that thrive on individualism. We have governance models that prioritize the winning party, that prioritize the victor that prioritize the czar. People who want services and care for all, people who believe you must prove your worth to, disturb, to deserve your keep, people who only trust their own bootstraps. We have washrooms closed at LRT stations because people keep dying of drug poisoning and yet we also are closing our safe injection sites while simultaneously failing to provide rehab spaces or supportive housing. We have people targeted and harmed across Edmonton for their ethnic, religious, or cultural, cultural attributes, for their gender or sexual identity, for their physical, intellectual, or resource vulnerabilities. And yet people complain that there is no prejudice no need for extra resources, that people just need to learn to take care of themselves, or that they should try harder to not stand out or to not put themselves at risk or not do dangerous things like go shopping at the mall or riding the train. There are always global visions that seem universal and obvious, peace, compassion, justice, and there are always local dreams that seem meaningful and important peace, compassion, justice. And the space between these two is filled with an endless myriad of conflicting options and methods of wielding power. And the space between each of our understandings as people who gather under one unifying UU banner may also be filled with a broad range of opinion. In fact, only within my own mind, which is seemingly one being, there are constant battles of rightness and wrongness and priority and urgency impacting my ability to live out or make manifest peace, compassion, and justice. There isn't even just one question. How could there possibly be just one answer? The point that I'm hoping to make is that there will never be full agreement. There will never be one right way to do things. And the pursuit of one right answer or system can be a distraction from the work that needs to be done. If you've ever been responsible for the care of children, even for an afternoon, or been a child, you know that there are no two people with caring philosophies that are exactly the same. In fact, most of us cannot live up to our own ideals and carry out our own personal philosophy faithfully when it comes to caring for another, never mind trying to agree with others about how it should be done. We try, but we quickly see how complex it is to do the right thing. We don't even know half the time what the right thing is. I can remember the grand ideas I had about child rearing, about how quickly I turned the corner toward when did I become my mother? And how often I thought, well, that seemed like a good idea. We'll never do that again. 
I joke that I wanted my children to grow up to know their own minds, to be able to speak out, to protect themselves, to not be bullied or pushed around, to be strong and independent and determined to be able to stand their ground. Except, of course, with me. Do you remember the first time someone in your care yelled no at the top of their little lungs and planted their little feet solidly on the ground? It might be funny, might be funny once if they were little and very cute. I remember when each of the boys turned three and they seemed to suddenly know that I couldn't make them. I mean, I could still pick them up and put them in the car, but I couldn't make them not yell. Not without violating every principle I so desperately was clutching to my frazzled chest. How at eight, they each discovered that I could no longer pick two of them up at once. How I couldn't conclusively corral one while wrangling the second. In one car door, I would put the first one. Out the other side, he would go while I went after his brother. How suddenly I learned that threats were useless because I didn't want to carry them out more than they were afraid that I would. How I couldn't leverage, okay, we're not going then, because I was the one who wanted or needed to go. And they knew it. They always knew it. And then at 13, as each one figured out that I could no longer pick them up at all. I had no more weight to pull, literally, as the saying goes. Now I make them sound worse than they actually were, truly, but three, eight, and 13 were not my favorite ages. It's like the calendar page turned and suddenly a new test of my will and determination was dropped off in the wonderful location where my beautiful child had once been. Six years of my life that I will gladly never get back. I'm pretty sure that that's the way everything works, really. We make a plan, we have a philosophy or an ideal guiding it, it gets tested, and we learn again and again where our power does or does not lie. The boys were smart. I wanted that for them. I just didn't want for them to use it against me. They were stubborn. I wanted that to protect them. I just hadn't anticipated that I was the one they would see as their enemy. They were great problem solvers, and for this I am grateful, until they tried to solve me. Over and over again, I learned where my power did and did not lie, and it was a moving, moving space. I could battle for it. I could surrender it, I could negotiate, but it was never solved, never won, always some act of shifting balance. We harm ourselves when we think that there is one system, one solution that we will arrive there and never have to face our questions again in pretty much anything. So what does that title mean? Broad visions and local dreams. Why are we talking about all these things that we can't seem to solve? And why all the futility? What I really wanted to say, what I want you to remember from this short time that we have together this morning is that there is no one right answer. No solution that must be achieved and all will be well. No answer that is eluding us and when we discover it, everything will be easy. No destination that will be the end of the line 
everything resolved, no more wondering or worrying, no more negotiation, no one right way to do things that we could just figure out and rest into. It was never about easy. It was never about painless. It was never even about succeeding. None of it, not life or work or church or politics or parenting. It is about caring about human decency, about peace and compassion and justice, about doing the best you know how, and most especially, it's about love. And when it's not about love, when love is, not, is no longer your guiding force, your core virtue at the center of everything, it's time to reset. Because when there's no love and care in a decision, any decision, it will hurt you or hurt others or hurt the community or hurt the planet. We all have big visions for the world, for what it means to be free and safe and well, for what people deserve simply as their birthright, for what is necessary and what is dangerous. And we won't all agree. And we have big visions for our local communities, our churches and schools and neighborhoods and families and ourselves, what it means to thrive and be well, what is worth our effort and resources, what should be shared. And we won't all agree. We are all always learning. Life is a negotiation. How we decide the balance of power is everything. Not so much the decision, but the ways we get there. People may forget decisions that were made years earlier, but they will remember the way they felt about the experience. They will remember the flavor of the moment. I don't remember why the boys didn't want to get in the car or even where we were going. I just remember feeling tired and frustrated and perhaps even outwitted. And I remember the delight I felt the day that I realized that they were old enough to leave at home alone. That I could go to the store in peace. That making them come didn't always matter. That if it wasn't fun for them, it sure wasn't going to be fun for me. And getting my way wasn't always worth it. I still had to wrangle them into the car for dentist days. And because they loved it when they got there, it was worth it to me to wrangle them in to take them to church. But to a show or a restaurant, if they didn't want to go, going without them was delightful and cheaper. They thought they got the best deal, and so did I. My wish for you this Mother's Day is that you each find the best deal in all that you do, where the people on both ends feel that they are receiving the gift. May the ways you make decisions <clears throat> excuse me, be a reflection of your highest ideals, even if the outcomes cannot always live up to your dreams. May you spend your sacred energy on things that are worthy of your efforts. May love be a compassionate, just, peaceful negotiation. May everything you do be rooted in love. May you be free. Blessed be.
bring those candles and chalices forward once again. Before I offer up the chalice extinguishing words, I want to say that um, my youngest, Casey, who many of you met when we first moved here, used to come to the women's dance circle, which is a precious place that Lori and I first connected where we would sing chants and dance often out in the park at Gabriel Dumont Park in Saskatoon and he was just this little guy with a whole bunch of women come together and he would sit in that circle he knew all the words to all the songs and he would sing them on the top of his little precious lungs and he would close his eyes and do this and every time we play that song that just played Rebecca playing the instrumental of the breathing meditation there is always at least one person in the room who makes that same face, who closes their eyes and does this with the music. And that has been such a gift to me. I just love to see something connect in someone's heart. It just made sense to tell a not obstinate Casey story to end there. Okay, now, shelter in this place, meditations on 2020. Words by the Reverend Lisa Deutsch, breakfast, chaos, and bedtime. Very early on, as the pandemic took hold in the United States, I wrote the following schedule on the Parsonage kitchen whiteboard one day. Breakfast, chaos, bedtime. I had for the first eight days or so of no school and 10 or more of social distancing been dutifully posting a detailed schedule every day. I knew that both residents of the parsonage thrive on structure and also resist it. I'd consumed a million pieces of internet advice, suggestions, warnings, and ideas. I'd paid attention to what pastors and parents on the West Coast were saying about life further along into the pandemic than we were in the Midwest. I'd been operating on the theory that it's easier to start structured and loosen up than to start loose and attempt to impose structure later. But that day, I couldn't do it. I could neither predict nor decide what our day would hold, other than a beginning and an ending and a whole lot of chaos in between. I'd done my best to hold chaos at bay, but here it was, even as on that very day, the Surgeon General of the United States was saying, it's going to get bad this week. A few days earlier, I had written, the first significant lesson of this time for me is that doing things the right way no longer means following the recipe as written. The second significant lesson I was learning was that I must let the chaos be chaos. Order and schedules would emerge. Order and schedules that I could neither impose nor even conceive from my pre-pandemic mindset. My job as pastor, as parent, as person is to let that happen, to trust that it will happen, and to have faith that it will contain blessings beyond my limited apprehension. This is when I should be writing an Easter or a Passover newsletter column, when I should be finding metaphors to remind us all that personal Good Fridays and Easter's, personal Passovers and Exoduses come into each of our lives that the biblical stories grew out of a need to make sense of human experience and that far from being imposed by an external authority, the holy days are organic reflections and celebrations of those lived experiences. This year instead, I'll just say, there is chaos in the Easter story along with celebration. There is chaos in the Passover story along with celebration. And there will be celebration in our pandemic story, along with chaos, when the time comes to make of this time in our lives a story. May we all be blessed by the courage and grace and the permission we need from whatever source to let things move the way they need to move and never grip so tightly that we freeze the line. Blessed be.
invite you now to share in the joy of our final song, Come Sing a Song with Me, played by Sheila Kaloran. <laughs> Thank you all for joining in this service this morning. We will now have our virtual coffee hour. You will see an invite for a breakout room, which you can join. If you'd like to stay in the center, simply decline that invite. And a reminder that next week's service is at 11 a.m. and it's not the Westwood link, it's the national link. So you can either go directly to the CUC calendar to find that or go to the Westwood calendar and click through on the links till you get to that special special link to get right there. And it's going to be a unique service, a non-traditional service, and the focus is on breath. So it will be embodied and beautiful, and I'm really excited to attend. <laughs>